So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Has everyone got a program or at least one between two? Because that means we can identify all these wonderful performers who worked so hard for this morning. Mozart was a remarkably small man, very thin and pale, and had a profusion of fine, fair hair, of which he was really rather vain. At this time, he and his family lived in a house in the Rheinsteiggasse in Vienna, which, like many of the houses in Vienna at that time, would have overlooked a, a stinking courtyard, and on the ground floor would have been shops and businesses. So they had the accommodation above there. And actually, it was quite a big house, and we still we know more about the house he lived in when he died than we do about the Requiem, of which more later, and about many other things about his life. There's still a detailed plan. But to continue on what he looked like, he really loved to dress well, and he took great care with his hair, and you read some of the letters, he talks about going to the hairdressers and everything. And he had a good lifestyle. They had two maids, so in a word, they overspent. And even money from La Clemenza de Tito used to pay off debts uh, didn't do the trick. And when he died, uh, going back to his clothing, there was a large inventory of really a lot of fine clothing that he had. He really took, took a lot of care with his dress. Other things pertinent to this final year. Theatres were closed months after Joseph II's death in the early part of Leopold II's reign. The Turkish war was draining resources from the nobility and the bourgeoisie. So there was a, a lack of support for music. Mozart's famous subscription series had stopped. So his income was limited. So in this year we're talking about, he wrote a lot for the Redoutensaal, for the dances. I think Kirkel's, uh, the early 600s have got about 15 Kirkel numbers, which are all dances. We won't be representing them today. Why did he do it? Because he needed the money. The man who was fated for Figaro, Don Giovanni, and the three late symphonies was now not forgotten, but he wasn't really bothered about a lot in Vienna. It's, uh, no, publics, publics are are fickle. Um, so he got some music from his position at the court, at the Hofburg, uh, for the dances, some money from Clemenza. He didn't actually get any money for flute, um, and he got some prepayment for the Requiem and a few other bits and pieces that he did. Uh, his new position, which he'd angled for at St. Stephen's as assistant Kapellmeister, that was unpaid, and he took that one on. His health and emotional condition were deteriorating, right throughout uh, those final months. But one of the many, many ironies is that in the final few months of his life, that might have been going down, but actually his prospects were coming up. Flute was a huge success. He was getting commissions elsewhere. And had he not had this wretched illness, um, he would have gone on, I think, to do great things. So what we're going to do this morning is just take a little look at some of the pieces he wrote during his final year. And first in the, in the year are the... Um, uh, three songs he wrote for Parch's uh, book called Liedesammlung für Kinder und Kinderfreude am Klavier. So these are a, a, a song collection for children and their friends. Um, why would he do such a little thing like that very late in his life? He needed the money and he also needed to show that he was willing to be part of society and there were big connections with the Stephansdorn, the St. Stephen's Cathedral. So he did them. And of course he loved kids. He had his own kids, two of them. And um, he also was quite childlike in other way. So although these are very slight little songs, they still show the uh, mark of the master. And what we've done is we've got, there are many, many verses uh, of these songs. So I've chosen just a, a small number of verses from the three songs. And we have some of our singers from right across first year through to near graduating who have got their German going and are going to sing these songs. And they are, just before they sing, actually going to tell you what they're singing about.
too unimportant because 
you probably noticed that the first song is used as the last movement of, of a 27 in B-flat piano concerto. So he, um, and the middle one is really a prototype for the first Vigarian and the Magic Flute. So they're, they're, pro they're proper pieces. Now the next piece uh, we're going to hear is his Adagio and Rondo for Glass Harmonica and Quartet. Now the Glass Harmonica was very, um, was, felt, was started in 1761 by Benjamin Franklin. He'd gone to London, where there was quite a vogue for wet fingers round wine glasses. And so he went there and heard it, and he thought that he could build something, in his own words, with a more convenient arrangement. So you, I haven't got pictures and all that, but you can look them up and see this glass. I'm on a quite long thing uh, with these, all these glasses going round. And it was first called a glass chord and had its premiere in London in 1762. Now, Mozart was introduced to the glass harmonica by a chap by the name of Mesmer. And if you've ever been mesmerized, you can thank Mr. Mesmer. And those of you uh, who know their Cosi Fan Tutti knows that it's uh, something that Despina uses in Cosi Fan Tutti as well. Anyway, that's how Mozart came to know about it. And he wrote one solo for it and this piece, K617. There were also glass harmonica pieces by Beethoven and Donizetti to mention, but two. It was put into his catalogue, and knowing Mozart composed pretty fast, on May the 23rd, and given its first performance in Vienna in the Burgtheater Academy on the June the 10th. And the manuscript is actually in the British Museum. There was a second performance uh, in the Kärtnertorg Theater on the 19th of August, and it was actually given the following year, oh, sorry, in 1794, not the following year, 1794, it was given in London in Hanover Square, which is, of course, the famous church which Handel did a whole load of, load of things in. And Mozart said of the glass harmonica, I hate the squeaky little thing. <laughs> anyway, um, our wonderful players are going to take their uh, places. And just my final thought is, it is usually now done on the piano, so we're being relatively authentic. But as you hear Imogen playing, and she, does, she gets this very beautifully, have in mind this very sort of a glassy, watery sound that would give, which gives this piece its particular color.
That was Kirkle 617, the next piece is Kirkle 618, and we go to June. He was moving back to writing much more church music. Perhaps musically he wanted to go that way, but certainly wanting that job at St. Stephen's Cathedral would have meant he had to show his credentials in that direction. And he was moving towards a, a, a simpler style, what the Germans sort of call Volk, Volkstümlichkeit, which is more unadorned, devotional, and much more easily understood. And so that accorded with what the Masons wanted, which in one of their things was vox populi, vox dei, what is the voice of the people is also the voice of God. And that's one of the huge uh, themes that runs through the magic flute. This was written for Corpus Christi, and it was written for a church where Constanza, who was pregnant at the time, was uh, living outside Vienna for her health. And the organist at the church in Baden by Wien was a man by the name of Anton Stoll. Now, I don't know whether our STEAM faculty member, Jill, is um, related to Mr. Ant Herr Stoll or not, but she has to make do. She is actually related to Schubert, so, you know, she's got quite a good start on things there. So it was written, it was written for Anton Stoll, and it was given its first performance in the parish church. I'll ask the singers to come forward. And I think, apart from being a complete miracle, this piece, I think, well known to everybody, it just makes one think what he might have gone on to write. When he was writing this, when he was writing the Requiem, he had a, a, quite a different way of approaching choral works than he had done with the C minor mass and the other pieces of, a, of the middle and early part of his career. He went to the voice parts first, and if you look at the sketches of the Requiem, you can see m where the sketches do exist. They are very much more the voices and some sketch outlines of the, uh, of the instrumental parts. So he was moving much more towards vocal music. So we're going to sing for you the Ave Verum, Hail, true body, born of the Virgin Mary, having truly suffered, sacrificed on the cross for mankind, whose pierced side flowed with water and blood. Be for us a foretaste in the trial of death. O sweet Jesus, holy Jesus, O Jesus, son of Mary, have mercy on me. Amen.
this time a commission came from Prague, his favorite city, to write an opera for the, um, the new uh, Leopold II, the new uh, Holy Roman Emperor, which he took up, and he wrote La Clemenza di Tito in 18 days. Uh, he traveled to, with Constanza, he traveled to Prague on the 28th of September, and uh, the first performance of La Clemenza di Tito was in the Estates Theatre, which had also seen Don Giovanni Cosio and Tutti, of course, was given in the Estates Theatre on the 6th of September. Not being one to hang around, he also conducted a performance of Don Giovanni on the 2nd of September. Anio's friend Sesto has been urged by Tito's jilted lover Vitellia to assassinate him. He goes to burn the capital and kill Tito, but gets the wrong Tito, and Tito is still alive. And in this first aria, Anio urges Sesto to fess up, admit to Tito that he's made the mistake and thereby will be exonerated.
Brazil, and to the, to the, the clemency comes out of that, and Tito lets uh, Sesto off, and actually everybody else does, does la clemenza di Tito. Now, we talked at the, I talked at the beginning about the fact that the nobility and the bourgeois were supporting opera less, they were sort of for all the reasons I gave. But in 1789, um, Joseph II invited somebody called Schikaneda to start a company in Vienna. And this was extremely important because he started a, a company at the Theater an der Wieden. Now, Schikaneda had met Mozart in 1781 in Salzburg, and um, <clears throat> He started this company in, in Vienna in 1789 for popular music. It was just slightly on the outskirts of Vienna, and it was not the high opera seria of the, the, the more, more uh, serious uh, other, other opera houses. So Schikaneda, as you know, wrote the words for the Magic Flute and played Papageno. He was an amazing man. He was an entrepreneur, a stage director. He also was a very, very serious actor as well, and uh, one of his specialities before he came to Vienna was all the major Shakespeare roles. Uh, so he was a man of some considerable uh, talent. What he initiated in the Theater an der Wieden was the writing of operas by a team, a kind of uh, group composition, team composition. And um, one of the pieces that was written uh, for this was called Der Stein der Weisen, the Philosopher's Stone, the Stone of the Wise, if you like. And this was the team included one Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. Um, they took the story from the place where Schikaneda and Mozart took the story for the magic flute, which is Wieland's Ginistan. The magic flute also came from various other, other things that were around at that time. It came from an opera called Lulu, funnily enough. It came from uh, another opera called Oberon, which contained a magic horn. So the magic flute comes out of a whole load of stuff that's going on in Vienna at that time. Now, Mozart contributed Little March, Summer in Act Two, and something else, but he did contribute one song to this Nun Liebes Weibchen. And just one other thing about the Stein der Weisen, before I get uh, Ra Rachel and Josh to come sing it, was just interesting in who was taking part in this. His very great friend, Benedict Schach, of whom we'll hear, hear more later, played Astromanti and Tamino. Franz Gehl played Oiti Fronte and Sorastro. Schikaneda himself played Lubano and also Papageno. Lubano played for us by Mr. Joshua White today, and Papageno later at the end by Mr. Samuel Piper, so we've got a sort of duo there. Um, Lubanara, which is Rachel's role in this little song, was played by Franz Gale's wife, Barbara Gale, who also played Papagena. Anna Gottlieb played Nadina. Remember, the piece is called Nadir and Nadina is the piece that they set it from, and she played Pamina. And uh, Johann Henneberg conducted both the Der Stein der Weisen and the Magic Flute. And of course, the little matter of Mozart composing for them and being around is what happens. Right. What's happening, Rachel? Who's starting? In this particular Josh. scene, <laughs> in this particular scene, myself, Lubano, and my wife, Lubanaro, 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 sorry. <laughs> uh, simple uh, country folk who are living a quiet, happily married life. Things don't stay quite that simple. The evil god, Oiti Fronte, has put an unusual curse upon me, which causes some marital difficulties. Uh, you'll notice similarities between our characters and Papageno and Papagena, like we just said. Um, you'll also notice uh, a similar trial to Tom, um, Tamino, uh, not being able to talk to Tamino in the example flow. <laughs> Thank you. 
first was that she could only answer in meows. You probably got that, yes. Um, the flute is next, magic flute. Vienna, as you might have picked up, was very much in recession at this time, which had affected a number of things, obviously about the theatres and so forth, but also the harvest, etc. There was a clampdown on public debate. The press was censored. Satire and parody were out. That's a shame. There was fear around, paranoia in the police, and a general disillusionment with the failure of the French Revolution. These are all backgrounds to the themes of the great masterpiece he wrote, The Magic Flute. Um, also, he was very keen to write a German opera. Beethoven called this the great German opera, but mainly because it was German. It's no greater than Figaro and Duvani, they're all just unbelievable. But in his eyes, you know, it was the new German opera. It was for the people, not the aristocracy. They needed a magic flute, a fairy tale from the Vienna suburbs, with more ordinary people went than the nobility to the performances, but a fairy tale also mixed with all the high Masonic and medieval guilds, masonry and myths and so forth. Schikaneda approached Mozart because Schikaneda needed the money. He offered Mozart a fee, but as far as we know, Mozart never got it. Um, anyway, he gave him a summer house in this new, there was the Theater auf der Wieden, but it was also in a park and everything. It was, a, it was quite a big complex. It was a big theater, deep stage and everything, so they're able to do marvelous things stagecraft-wise with the magic flute. And he was given a summer house to compose. Constanza, if you remember, was still out in Baden, where the Ave Verum was performed. And amongst them, there were lots and lots of parties, not least with the Irish tenor Michael Kelly, from whom we used to learn so much about Mozart. Uh, and Mozart was dragged off to parties which I think he quite liked. But also the rumor goes that he was kept going, particularly in the evenings, on red wine and oysters when he was writing, when he was writing the magic flute. The flute is riddled with myths and symbols of wisdom, nature, and reason being the big, some of the big themes. Uh, it's all about the improvement of oneself, personal development, the trials of love, uh, light over darkness, good over evil, it's many and many, many more things come into this amazing patchwork hybrid that is the magic flute. But for me, and it's only my personal opinion, I think the biggest thing that the magic flute says is the power of music. In the end, music wins at all points. I think there's a slight clue also in the title. It was well received, Mozart was pleased with it, he went quite a lot, he fixed parties to go, and even took Salieri as his guest, and Salieri praised it to the hilt. You can see the magic flute, or see big, most of it, scenes of the magic flute in two weeks' time. And we have some of our wonderful cast here today who are going to sing three short arias, and they will tell you what they are doing. Tamino and Tamina safe as they undertake their time of trials. I am 
This next aria, I'm playing the character of Monostatos, who is a subordinate to Sir Astro, a slave master. And I'm in love with the beautiful Amina. However, I am myself am very ugly. And in this aria, I am telling the moon to turn its eyes away from me. How could I possibly love you? I'm so out of my league. <laughs> Thank you. 
the Requiem, a bit of chronology. On the 14th of February, the Countess von Walsech died. In the summer, Count Walsech came to Mozart and asked him to write a Requiem in memory of his wife and offered a commission of 60 ducats. He was back in Vienna from Prague uh, by the middle of September, and the first performance of the Magic Flute was on the 30th of September. And on the 16th of October, he had the little matter of the clarinet concerto premiere, and on the 15th of November, the little Masonic cantata premiere, which went very well and cheered him up. This was in weeks of his death, and he was really down in the dumps, but the performance of that temporarily cheered him up. By the 20th of November, he was confined to his bed. Now, very briefly, I've told you that he was going back to music of the polyphony and of other times. And if I play you this, I want you to tell me what piece, well, I don't mean this is not a school. <laughs> That's the opening of Mozart's Requiem, but it isn't. It's from The Ways of Zion Do Mourn by Handel. Pretty much taken. If I play you this. Etc. That's all that is that is from the Dettingen T Diem of Handel as well. And just one other, there are others, but if I play you this. It's not the Ricciacari, uh, the Recordari, I'm sorry, from the Requiem. It's by W.F. Bach, and there are other examples. So he was really delving into the music of the past and making it his own. He was confined to bed on the 20th of November, and he never really um, recovered from that. The only piece of the Requiem which he completed was the opening in Troitus. Then it, the completion was first given to Abler, one of his friends, and then to Freistedler, who was given a commission to finish the Kyrie. But in fact, in the end, as we all know, it was his, well, friend Susmar who finished it. Um, and Mozart had quite a funny view about Susmar. He said he really can be quite an ass. Now, there's a, of for Mozart's death, there's a wonderful description by his son, Karl, who says, particularly remarkable is, in my opinion, the fact that a few days before my father died, his whole body became so swollen that the patient was unable to make the smallest movement. Moreover, there was a stench which reflected an internal disintegration and after death increased to the extent that an autopsy was rendered impossible. And Nissen, Lord Georg Nissen, the Swede, who eventually married Costanza, has another recollection. His final illness, he was bedridden and it lasted 15 days, with swelling of the hands and feet and almost total inability to move. Sudden vomiting and military fever. He was completely conscious until two hours before his death, and the sensations of his forthcoming death, his sorrow at having to leave his wife and children unprovided for, certainly tripled the martyrdom of his sickness. On the day he died, he had the score of the Requiem uh, brought to his bed. Didn't I say before that I was writing this requiem for myself? Thus he spoke and looked over the whole attentively, with tears in his eyes. It was the last painful farewell to his art. Baron von Sweeten came at once after Mozart's death to weep with the widow who had crawled into the bed of her dead husband. So these are the hours before Mozart died. And I have another couple of very short little uh, readings. This is from Sophie Heibel, who was Constanza Mozart's sister. And she writes, late in 1825, but she writes, Sussmeyer was there at Mozart's bedside, and the well-known requiem lay on the coverlet, and Mozart was explaining to him how he thought he should finish it after his death. There was a long search for the doctor who was found in the theatre, but he had to wait till the play was over. He prescribed cold compresses and gave him such shock that he did not gain consciousness before he passed away. The last thing he did before he died was to try and mouth the sound of the timpani part of the requiem. And then from Benedict Schuck, who we met in Der Stein, Der Weisen, we have this. On the very eve of his death, so this would have been a little bit before Sophie Heibel's account. On the very eve of his death, he had the score of the Requiem brought to his bedside. And himself, it was two o'clock in the afternoon, sang the alto part. Schuck, the family friend, sung the soprano line, as he'd always done. Hofer, Mozart's brother-in-law, took the tenor. And Gerla, we've met him as Sarastro, and Oiti Fronte uh, sang the bass part. They were at the first bars of the Lacrimosa 
when Mozart began to weep bitterly, laid the score on one side, and 11 hours later, at one in the morning of the 5th of December, or 1255, actually, exactly, 1255, December 1791, as is well known, departed this life. And the lacrimosa was incomplete, sung in that bedroom, and the last notes that Mozart ever wrote. on the 5th. The funeral was in St. Stephen's Church, a cathedral nearby on the 6th, and then they took the hour's walk out with just a handful of people, to uh, an hour's walk out of Vienna to the St. Mark's Cemetery where he was buried anonymously and we still don't really know where he was. Two little things that Mozart wrote I think I want to share with you about this greatest of all composers. I believe, he says, that kindness cures everything that magnanimous and forbearing conduct has often reconciled the different enemies. And of his own death, he wrote not of his own death, of his father's death, but death in general. He wrote at the time of his father's death, death is the true goal of our existence, no longer terrifying to me, but indeed very soothing and consoling. Death is the key that unlocks the door to happiness. We also have somewhere in the sources that alongside the, the unfinished lacrimosa, and the singing of other parts of the Requiem, he, with Susmaya, tried to croak out the first song from the magic flute. And as I think Mozart would have wanted, I want to end this, this little uh, look at the last year of Mozart's life on a, on a happy note, because he would have wanted to do too. He, of all composers I know, can put that Shakespearean brilliance of tragedy right next to comedy, as Shakespeare himself would have said, cheek by jowl. But I leave the last spoken words to Haydn, his great friend Joseph Haydn, who said, we will not see his like in a hundred years. I would posit we haven't seen his like since. Thank you.